Hi, everybody. It's Gordon Firemark, the podcast lawyer, and I'm here to uh, answer a, a question that I'm seeing fairly commonly or variations of it fairly commonly in um, Facebook posts and, and uh, online uh, community of, of one sort or another. And I thought I would just come on in here and try to dispel some misconceptions because lots of the legal advice that I'm seeing on Facebook is either wrong or incomplete. And I wanted to come online today and... Uh, uh, and, and dispel some of those misconceptions, clear if, if you think. So stick with me. What's going on here? It's not working. All right, gang. Hi again, Gordon Firemark here. The question that I'm addressing today is this one. It is, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from a Facebook post that, that sort of says it well. I'd love people's input about copyright implications of a podcast that reads short extracts from published works, poetry, and prose. It looks like it's not allowed under copyright without express permission from the authors, which wouldn't really be feasible for my project. Thoughts about any loopholes or possibilities to, with integrity, sidestep permissions and requirements? Well, you know, as I said, lots of the advice that I'm seeing here on Facebook is either wrong or incomplete, and I want to get in, in here to clear things up again. First of all, I would say that looking for loot loopholes and ways to sidestep permissions requirements with integrity is a bit of an oxymoron. Integrity means doing what's right under the law and what's right morally by the person or people who own the work that you're using. So, um, you know, I'm not trying to shame anybody, but let's just be really honest about what integrity means. Do, do the right thing and, and get it right. So first, let me give you a few basics so that we have um, a perspective. So copyright protection in um, first, you know, copyright protection comes from way back. It goes back to England in the um, in the middle of the I want to say the 15th or 16th century, uh, 17th century. Sorry, the 1600s. Uh, the Statute of Anne protected the rights of authors to retain ownership and control over things that they created. Uh, here in the United States, it's actually authorized by the Constitution in what's called the Copyright Clause that grants power uh, to Congress to um, preserve for the rights of authors and inventors um, for limited times the uh, exclusive rights to their, uh, their inventions and, uh, and works. So, um, so that's where the Constitution authorizes it. And then, of course, copyright law has been established by Congress. It's federal law here in the U.S., um, and most other countries have similar laws, and, and uh, you know, we are actually signatory to international treaties and so on. So most of what I'm going to say here applies across uh, international boundaries, with the exceptions that I'll mention, and, and I'll, I'll specify where U.S. law is a little unique. Anyway, copyright protection kicks in the moment a work is created. Now, that under old laws, there were different rules, but since the early 1900s, when you create the work, you own a copyright from that moment of creation. There's no requirement anymore of registration or copyright notice or anything like that. And copyright protection lasts a really long time. For works created before January 1st, 1978, copyright expires the end of the 95th year following its first either publication or, uh, or uh, registration if, if it wasn't published for a while. So, so basically, you've got a 95-year window. That is uh, anything created since 1925, for those who are counting, is most likely still protected under copyright. There are a few exceptions. Things expired at certain points, and, and, um, and uh, if they weren't renewed properly and things like that. But most works created before, uh, excuse me, between 1925 and 1978 are still covered by protection uh, for up until the 95th year. And uh, and just to be clear on that, the end of the term is December 31st of that 95th year, no matter what the actual date of publication or whatever was. Now, works after 1978, so created January 1st or later of 1978, last for, the protection lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. So theoretically, if you wrote it on January 1st, 1978, and died on January 2nd, 1978, you would have until, um, what is that, uh, uh, 70 years after 19, uh, 1978 would be um, 2048, would be the, uh, the end of that 70th year. So uh, there's your copyright protection. I think I did that math right. All right, so what is protected by copyright? Well. Copyright grants the author 
the exclusive right to do these things or authorize others to do those things. That is one, to make copies of the work, two, to distribute those copies, three, to display, or four, to perform the work in public, and fifth, to make derivative works. That's works that are based on, in part or in whole, the original thing. So making a film from a screenplay is making a derivative work. Now, in our case, the, the hypothetical situation that we're talking about, reading bits of poetry or, or prose from published books uh, as a podcast, would be copying the work into another medium, performing part of the work publicly and making a derivative work. So that is an exclusive right that belongs to the owner of the copyright unless it is granted to someone else. Now, sometimes the owner of the copyright, the author transfers it to the publisher or something like that. Most of the time, it's still the author. So copyright infringement is to do any of those things without proper authorization. Now, one way to get that authorization is by express permission. That is getting the author or the owner to say, yes, you may do these things. And usually that's a license agreement. License and permission are almost interchangeable in this, in this word. When we talk about licensing, we're really just talking about uh, the, the act of getting permission to use something in a certain way. And it's tends to be fairly narrow tailored. You can do this, but not that. You can have it for this amount of time. You can do it in this medium, in this language, those kinds of things. You can divide up the, the copyright into very discrete little portions. So express permission is the one we think of as licensing. And there's also some statutory position uh, permission. That means that under the law, under the Copyright Act itself, Title 17 of the United States Code, there are a couple of, of uh uh, authorizations that are built in. One is called the Teach Act. It's teachers using a work for classroom purposes for teaching, not charging admission, not the concert or anything like that, but you know, if you're actually using it in the classroom, no licensing required, no permission required. That's an exception under the, uh, under the current copyright law. Making cover recordings. If, you, if, a, if a musical composition has previously been recorded and published, um, you know, a, a, an album released then, um, or record released, I should say, then there's a compulsory license. That is anybody else who wants to make a cover recording of that song, which is basically a derivative work, but without substantially changing the lyrics or the musical melody line and the, those kinds of things. That is permissible, subject to the payment of a royalty that's established by law. And um, if you're in the music business and you're doing um, cover recordings, you'll need to understand those rules. And then there's another one called fair use. Now, this is a principle that comes up under the First Amendment free speech principles and free freedom of press principles here in the United States. It was originally developed by the courts as a, an approach to balancing or, or, or um, um, you know, dealing with these countervailing principles. One, free speech, free press on one side, and the other, copyright, also authorized by the Constitution, which gives the Congress the right to say, you can't say that because it's a copy, <laughs> right? So we have this inherent conflict. So the courts over the course of the 1900s, basically, through the 1900s, um, uh, figured out a strategy for dealing with that, and that dealt with this four-factor uh, analysis that, that I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, in 1976, when the Copyright Act was revised, starting in 1978, Section 107 of the Copyright Act says, uh, establishes this fair use as a as a literal defense in the Copyright Act. Um, I see some questions coming in. I'm going to answer those at the end, but let me finish my my discussion here. So that fa fair use basically involves a, a look at four different factors. One is the purpose and character of the allegedly infringing work, and that's the one where people get this idea that that uh, well, if it's only if it's educational or it's criticism and commentary or whatever, or it's journalism or documentary, that that's enough and that satisfies it. That is only one of the four factors. Those kinds of uses are generally considered to be First Amendment heavy uses. We want education, criticism, commentary, journalism, documentary, and parody to happen, but it. It's not carte blanche. You have to do the rest of this analysis. And this is analysis that's done for each and every alleged act of infringement on an ad hoc basis. There's no rules of thumb. So there is no, you can use four bars of music or you can use this many notes or this many seconds or those kinds of things. There are no rules of thumb. The next factor, so f purpose and character of the infringing use is number one. Next factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion taken. This is where I'm only using a small snippet versus I'm copying the whole thing comes into play and it weighs out exactly how you'd expect it to. The nature of the original work is the third factor and that really deals with, um, you know, is it is it itself a news kind of, if, you, if you're 
stealing a piece of, if you're using a piece of, of news to tell a news story, then that's the same kind of work. It's not going to be as likely to be fair use as if you're showing a picture of an artwork and you're talking about the death of the artist or something like that. As a news item, that would probably be more toward fair use. And the fourth factor is the impact on the potential market for the original and where there's a licensing marketplace like with music and and literary works and things like that uh, not paying for a license has an impact on the market right so there's that and then there's this fifth sort of um i don't want to call it a spoiler factor but it's an it's a fifth component to this analysis of transformativeness whether or not the the use in question the allegedly infringing use is a substantial transformation of the nature of the work as a whole so when it becomes very artistic very creative um, not merely changing from one medium to another, but also changing messaging and the overall tone and character of the work, maybe that weighs in favor of a finding of fair use. So that's a complicated analysis that you're going to end up paying lawyers to do for you and argue in front of a judge and or a jury. So keep that in mind. That's the only real way to rely on fair use is to let it go to court and, and defend the case. Uh, another one is the de minimis use. This is another uh, legal principle, not codified exactly, but it's basically the idea that the, the use is so small, the courts aren't going to allow plaintiffs to make mountains out of molehills. So that's the, the, those are the sort of basics right there. So the bottom line here is you cannot use all or significant portions of any copyright protected work, whether it's music or film clip or poetry, literary, sculptural, architectural, whatever, unless that use is authorized either by the owner or by the law, and that by law category is, as I've just explained, pretty limited. Also, the fair use exception is a U.S. principle only. It does not really apply outside the U.S. Other countries have similar, some other countries have similar principles, but um, you really, you know, you're, you're chancing it. So relying on these exceptions is a big risk because doing it means hiring a lawyer to defend you in the lawsuit. That is very expensive and a very big headache all around. So I'm going to address a few comments and questions that I got when I responded in the, in the Facebook posts. Uh, Tim O'Brien asked the question, well, how do you explain when journalists quote third-party source material and creative works? And I explained that journalism, true journalism, is a profession, and it has for itself clear guidelines that are based and, and sculpted by the law and by lawyers. <laughs> so it's true that very short attributed quotes do sometimes fall within the exceptions, but merely calling a podcast a piece of journalism, or by extension, calling yourself a journalism, doesn't necessarily a journalist, excuse me, doesn't necessarily make it so. The First Amendment comes into play, as I said, and unless you're a newspaper and you're ready and willing and financially able to mount that constitutional legal defense, it is pretty risky to rely on this thing. Most news outlets carry insurance, or they have the internal capital resources to fork over a five-figure retainer to their lawyer. Most podcasters don't. Okay, James Carey said uh, something really good. Um, he said, wow, this is an exciting thread, isn't it? This is one of those things where the law is pretty clear, but no one really wants to test it since losing is a disaster. In fact, being taken to court and winning is still pretty awful. Agreed. Overall, I guess that unless you're specifically critiquing uh, that particular work and that particular part of that particular work, you could be on pretty thin ice. So if you're doing a podcast about the Dubliners by James Joyce, you're probably okay to quote a few lines to back up a point you're making about the book. But you're not okay quoting a big chunk of the book if the podcast is about something else and you want to create an effect. Or just a side note, or if the podcast is about the Dubliners and you read a big chunk of it, also uh, an issue. Although I don't know if the Dubliners is still protected under copyright. Um, always, always, always veer on the side of caution and act in good faith and attribute and you're probably fine. Probably, and that's the problem. And by the way, attribution is not always um, a savior. In fact, sometimes it's actually a smoking gun because it shows that you knew where, where it came from and you didn't get permission. <laughs> so now excerpts with proper attribution are likely okay. Doesn't sound like there's any, this is in someone else's comment. Excerpts with proper attribution are likely okay. Doesn't sound like there's any financial gain here. Purposes of review and education are usually okay. These are readings, not recordings. Music is not involved, not li no licensing issues, so long as plagiarism is not involved. Well, I'm going to take issue with that in parts because the, this, this one is just uh, fallacious in so many ways. So listen, financial gain is not a factor. If you're copying, even for no profit, and it's not authorized and it's not excused under the law, it is still copying. It is illegal. 
Music isn't the only kind of work that copyright law covers. It covers all of those things I read earlier, sculptural, architectural, uh, literary, poetry, uh, music, of course, both the lyrics and the musical components, video, film, stage play. It covers everything, uh, all, any kind of author work of authorship. So uh, as long as there are no licensing issues. Well, listen, as I said earlier, permission to use any kind of copyrighted work is what's called a license. License is synonymous in this instance with permission. Plagiarism. Plagiarism and copyright infringement are very similar concepts, but <coughs> excuse me, there can be plagiarism without copyright infringement, and there can be copyright infringement without plagiarism. See, plagiarism is more about that attribution, and it need not be actual copying. You could not copy any of the words, but express the same ideas in the same rough sequence and so on without infringing copyright, but if your source material, you know, if it's obvious that you're just getting it all from one source, that's plagiarism. It's, it's, it's sort of an academic principle, right? It comes from uh, well, we see it applied in the uh, in the educational arena, where a college student, you know, paraphrases someone else's term paper, turns it in, and, and is accused of plagiarism. Likewise, in the journalism space, um, we see that where where someone publishes uh, someone else's work by paraphrasing, rewording, and so on. So that actually plays into the idea that you know it isn't enough just to change what what they've said, change the words around. That's still plagiarism, but it wouldn't be copyright infringement because you're not copying the actual expression of the ideas. Uh, and attribution, as I said, not an, does not excuse copying if there's no permission. In fact, when you give attribution for infringing work, we lawyers will hold that up and say, you knew who authored this, right? Did you ask them for permission? <laughs> you know, there you go. So it becomes that smoking gun. Gus says... Uh, I've reviewed two books on my show, and I've listened to countless episodes of other review bo book review shows, uh, or that that review or quote books verbatim. You know, um, I think that unless you're reading those poems or claiming they're yours, I don't see any reason for legal action to take place. Unless you just sit there and read the whole book, I can't think of an issue. Well, I can, <laughs> but that's my job. So, if you read a few things from a book in a way that reviews the book and the author's work, which then encourages your listeners to go buy the book, I can't imagine you'll get in trouble for it. Well, look. Uh, as I said, fair use is what you're sort of talking about. You're, you're working around that issue of fair use. But look, not getting caught or not getting sued or hassled or whatever, no matter how many other people have done it, is not the same as it being legal. And each fact situation, each copyright owner, also sometimes called a plaintiff, is different, right? Um, and here, the idea that this encourages uh, the listeners to buy the book, that argument sounds vaguely like the idea of... of, of the value of exposure. And all I'm going to say to that is when you when you tell a musician, hey, you should play my party because it'll be great exposure. Exposure can't be used to buy groceries. It can't be used to put a mortgage, to pay the mortgage to keep a roof over your head. It can't be used to buy your children's shoes and clothing. So exposure is nice, but it's not the same as, as the, the rights that are pertinent to ownership of property. And copyright is intellectual property. You own it. You get to control who uses it and how, just like I own my car. You don't get to come along and say, oh, that's a nice car. I think I'd like to drive it around and just hop in and drive it. That's called stealing, okay? And finally, if you read key passages, you could actually be undermining sales. Even that, even that is not really an important factor. Copying for any reason is illegal unless there's an authorization or an excuse under the law, period. And that's that. So, that's my, my point. Now, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, JJ says, thank you for sharing such great information. JJ, happy to, happy to help out. That's what I'm here for. It's my mission in life. And uh, Paco says, as a music educator and live streamer in Mexico, how can I circumvent YouTube's restrictions on including short music samples in my stream without being flagged? Is there a special category that I can apply for with YouTube and or Facebook, such as the Teach Act? Paco, I'm sorry to say, no, you can't. YouTube is a private business, and they can put in any restrictions in place that they want to. Now, their restrictions tend to be on the edges of the law in terms of they've, they're they allowing it to go as far as they think the law will work to protect them, right? So, and YouTube was, was on the defense side of a nine-year-long litigation brought by Viacom. I think it was nine years long. Uh, over over video footage and um, and they implemented their protocols 
as a way of making sure that they fall squarely within the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, what's called a safe harbor. And so they're not, you're not going to get anywhere with YouTube. The bottom line is the TEACH Act is only for in-classroom use of material by a teacher. So the moment you upload it to YouTube, it's no longer in-classroom use, and it doesn't count. So that wouldn't work. Uh, short music samples in your stream without being flagged, there is no way to circumvent. As soon as you say circumvent, I say no. Get permission or don't use it. If you are teaching the, the musical structure of a particular piece of music, um, I guess you sort of need to perform that little passage in order to do it. Um, I, I, I suppose you could, you could uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you could respond to each time it's flagged and say, this is fair use, this is fair use, this is fair use. But I don't think you're going to get anywhere establishing yourself with YouTube as a fair user every single time because this is an individual one-to-one -one analysis. We do it on every single act of infringement. So I'm sorry, I just don't have good news for you there. Um, it, it, you know, one, one approach would be to host the videos on a, a site that you control and um, have a conversation with the hosting company so that if they get those DMCA takedown notices, they will um, respond accordingly, take things into account. Uh, but YouTube is, is an automated system and they're going to do what they're going to do because they want to stay out of legal trouble themselves. I'll real quickly explain what that, f what that uh, safe harbor that I mentioned is all about because I think it's, it's, uh, it's relevant. So under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, this is the law that provides for uh, the takedown mechanism, right? An internet service provider company, an internet information service, can hold itself exempt and, and safe in that safe harbor from being sued for, for copyright infringement because they're making a copy too, right? And they're performing it too. So they, what the law did in order to foster the internet in the early 2000s, the uh, Congress said, look, we know this internet thing is important. We want to give these, these companies a fair shake at, at operating without getting sued every 10 minutes. So if they establish a set of procedures that allows for an owner of copyright to give them notice and require it to be taken down, and they do take it down, and they impose uh, a, a system of, of you know dealing with repeat infringers so it doesn't just keep becoming a constant game of whack-a-mole, um, then as long as they follow those procedures, then there's a, uh, a safe harbor. They're not eligible to be sued. They're immune from those, those lawsuits. So YouTube obviously wants to be as careful about that as possible, and they've implemented... That system, you can go on and make a copyright claim and they, they immediately take it down. Or they, they have the uh, automated system which is designed to sort of head that off. And that's partly the product of that big Viacom lawsuit. So uh, once the takedown notice is given, they generally act within, I think it's 24 hours is the, is the maximum outside time, um, by taking it down and notifying the person who posted the content. Then that person has a right to do a counter notification once YouTube gets that counter notification, they put the material back up and they say, okay, you guys go duke it out and let us know what the result is. And as long as they follow up that procedure fairly and appropriately, they are um, safe from lawsuits. An interesting case that just recently came down was dealing with Cox Communications uh, being notified that many of their users were infringing copyrights and not taking things down and not punishing the repeat infringers and those kinds of things. And a jury recently awarded um, the music companies a billion-dollar judgment, one billion with a B against Cox Communications. And um, similar suits are going on in other places, and we expect similar results, and probably see Supreme Court and stuff like that. Cox is a big company. They can fight these defenses. Uh, but because they didn't follow a procedure and didn't have an, a, a mechanism for dealing with those repeat infringers, they were not immune under that safe harbor. So that's the whole background on the safe harbor. I've gone on long enough. I think I'm probably into it for 24 minutes already. So I'm going to say thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you have questions about copyright law and other laws related to podcasting, please come join me. Oh, I should put something up on the screen and tell you a little bit. Uh, this coming Saturday, May 2nd, 2020, so if you're seeing this before May 2nd, you have an opportunity to attend my podcaster's, uh, where did it go? My podcaster's legal and business boot camp. That's at podlawbootcamp.com. It's going to be 
Uh, Saturday morning, uh, California time, Pacific time, I'm in Los Angeles, so 9 o'clock in the morning until we're done, probably two or three hours worth of, of content, um, the, the Podcaster's Business and Legal Boot Camp. And we're going to be covering all kinds of goodies like forming your corporation or limited liability company, when you should do it and why you should do it. And how, I will show you how to do it yourself. Likewise, with um, registering trademark to protect your podcast title and uh, uh, protecting your intellectual property, as I've talked about here, as well as respecting the intellectual property of others. We'll talk about dealing with co-hosts and co-producers and ownership issues and and dealing with all your vendors and having good contracts and, and also uh, the rules around advertising and sponsorships so you can get everything done right so you can monetize your podcast easily, effortlessly, and, um, and uh, cleanly without fears about getting sued or getting in trouble with the regulators and those kinds of things. So join me at uh, Podcasters Business and Legal Bootcamp on May 2nd. Head on over to podlawbootcamp.com to register. The price is going up a little bit every day now between now and Saturday, so you're going to want to get in and register right away and, uh, and get in there now. So once again, thank you for watching. I'm Gordon Firemark, the podcast lawyer. Appreciate your being here with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Post your questions in the comments or start a new post on the page, and I'll talk to you very soon. Happy, happy.